the next 30 minutes could change your life. Hello again. I just want to welcome you to Redemption with Ron Carpenter, and I get to be your host today. I am Ron. It's so nice to be with you. And for those of you that may be joining us for the first time, you know what? If you'll just hold that channel right where it is and give us a few minutes, maybe something a little different, maybe a different sound. Maybe we can breathe some life into your day. Maybe we can be a breath of fresh air into your situation. You know what? Have you ever heard people say stuff like this? Well, it is what it is. Or some things just never change. You know, if you deal with the same things long enough without seeing any change, it beats you into believing that there's some things that are just immovable in life. You're going to have to accept that that's the way it is and it's not subject to change. But the Bible tells me if I have mountains in my life, I can speak to them and eventually they're going to move. That I have power in what I say. You're going to be hearing me in a series of teachings called Dream On. And here's one of the things I want you to remember as we dream. Life does come to the dreamer. Miracles do still happen and change can still occur. And I want to be a person that God uses to build your faith to believe again, to dream again. A lot of us around the world have been in very, very difficult times and seen circumstances that just seem like they will not go away. But I want to be a voice of one like John the Baptist crying in the wilderness. There's something that's about to happen, and I want us to get ready for it. And it's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. Have I got your attention yet? Don't go away. I'm going to read 17 verses. Then I'm going to take about 20 to 25 minutes, and I'm going to open this thing up today. And we're going to get started. Do your best not to miss. Schedule everything you can around it. These are not messages you're going to want to miss. They'll change your life. <laughs> Verse 1. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to dwell in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech. The name of his wife was Naomi. The name of his two sons were Malon and Shelion, Ephratites of Bethlehem, <coughs> Judah. They went to the country of Moab and they remained there. So they left Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to Moab. Then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left and her two sons. They took wives of the women of Moab. The name of one was Orpah, the name of the other was Ruth, and they dwelt there for 10 years. They both, then both Malon and Shilion also died, so the women survived her two sons and her husband. So the dad's dead, and the two sons are dead. And all that's left is a mother and two daughter-in-laws. Are we all on the same page so far? <laughs> Let's keep reading. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had visited the people by giving them bread. Therefore she went out from the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. And Naomi said to her daughters-in-law, Go, return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with uh, uh, as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest each in, his, uh, in the house of her husband. So she kissed them and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, Surely, surely we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are, you, are there still sons in my womb? that they may be your husband? She said, I can't have you two more sons to get married. Turn back, my daughters, go, for I'm too old to have a husband. If I should have hope, I should have a husband tonight and should also bear sons. Would you wait for them till they were grown? Would you restrain yourselves from having husbands? No, my daughters, for it grieves me very much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. 
Then they lifted up their voices and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And she said, Look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Hmm. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave you. Somebody said you... Y'all said this at your wedding. You didn't even know you was quoting the book of Ruth. I don't know how this made it to a wedding because this is Ruth talking to her mother-in-law. It ain't a husband talking to a wife or a wife to a husband. And treat me not to leave you or turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people will be my people and your God my God. Where you die, I will die. And there will I be buried. Let me stop right there. Lord, bless your word in Jesus' name. Turn to your neighbor and say, this is going to be amazing. You may be seated. <coughs> Hallelujah. I'm so looking forward to preaching this, I'm nervous. Brother Ken, who organizes my notes for me every morning, he said, man, you got about 13 pages of notes in here. I said, well, I got the notes from 05, and then I've got everything I've learned since 05. And then I said, I got some stuff I'm reading and learning right now. And you start intertwining all that together. We might be teaching Ruth till Jesus comes back. Hallelujah. <laughs> Which would be just fine with me. I want to uh, basically let you know the characters of this book right here. There is a guy that you've probably heard him talk about a lot. And um, maybe you didn't know where he's from, but he's Boaz. All the ladies, I guarantee you they know who, who Boaz is. <laughs> Boaz is rich. Boaz is single. Boaz is looking for a good woman. Y'all acting like you don't know what I'm talking about. Problem is, too many women end up with Bozo. <laughs> I'm done. That didn't have nothing to do with it. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, didn't, I was all serious and had y'all crying and... Boaz, his name means strength. A husband needs to be a strong man. And he's a type of Christ in this story. You got Elimelech. And I don't know how to spell his name, so tonight he's Eli. <laughs> Elimelech, okay? Hallelujah. <laughs> Which means God is my king. Okay? Then you got Naomi. Limelech's wife. Her name means pleasant. Then you've got Orpah. Uh, yeah, there we go. Her name means turn back. I'm about to preach. Then you've got Ruth. Her name means something worth seeing. And every Boaz is looking for something worth seeing. And everybody that knows they're worth being seen will wait for Boaz to show up. <laughs> now, we got a long way to go, but I want you to know the characters of this story and what's going on right here. The great thing about the book of Ruth, and this is somewhat introductory, but we're going to get into it today. <laughs> the great thing about the book of Ruth is that unlike a lot of other stories in the Bible, we get to see their whole life. You're going to see their whole life in four, in four chapters. And you're going to see how God was at work in everything. And that is the problem with our life. I could take a whole message and just preach that. Because I would dare say the, the great majority of the people that are listening to me in here and over the internet and in Asheville and Charlotte right now, you have things that you have gone through, you are going through, or you are entering, and you have no idea how this is going to benefit you. You've asked God, how are you going to make this thing work out for my good and your glory? You've got things. How in the world is this a part of the plan? And when you see Ruth, you're going to see a book that involves famine. You're going to see a book that involves poverty. 
You're going to see a book that involves false gods. You're going to see a book that involves religion. You're going to see a book that involves quitting. You're going to see a book that involves prosperity. You're going to see a book that involves miracles. You're going to see a book that involves good, bad, good relationships, bad relationships. And at the end, you are going to see how God took a whole life and wove it into exactly what he wanted it to be and took it exactly where he wanted it to go. And if I could just take a reprieve for two minutes and let some of you know, there will come a day where you will see the whole picture and a lot of things that don't make sense right now will make sense. And we get to see Ruth's life as a whole and we say, man, isn't this a wonderful, wonderful book where she's over here in poverty and then she meets her Boaz and they ride off into the sunset and they got plenty of everything they need. Well, the fact is all the chapters of your life have not been written yet. And there were some phases in Ruth's life that if you would have had an interview with her, she probably wouldn't have had much of a better attitude than you have. Because you don't know how God is working this present situation out. And if some of you could see how this thing's going to play out, you wouldn't be complaining near like you're complaining right now. If some of you knew, if I got any help in this, if some of you knew how this enemy you are against is playing right into God's plan, you would quit worrying about the enemy and you'd just start praising God and resting in his peace. If some of you could see how this momentary affliction is working on your behalf, you would quit talking about your affliction all the time and you would start turning your attention on God because Ruth is going to show you there is a God. I don't care how bad it gets. I'm going to be tired when I go home today because I've got to preach in me. When there's a God, no matter how bad it gets, he never turns loose of the steering wheel. He never is an absentee at any time in your life. He never disappears. He never leaves you. And even in your worst of times, it's not a sign God God is absent sometimes it's a sign God is present because God knows everything that's got to happen for you to go where you need to go and everything that's got to happen for you to be who you want to be and if anybody knows you serve a God that knows what he's doing shout hallelujah more of this life-changing word from Ron Carpenter in just a moment here in America, we are being fed a steady diet of loose boundaries and disrespect through the many media outlets available to us today. Ron Carpenter has designed his new series, How to Change Your Life in 10 Days, to help counter a culture of dishonor and gives you keys to a total turnaround in your life. Whatever you honor is drawn towards you, and whatever you honor gives you the ability to access. Whatever you disrespect will move away from you and whatever you disrespect you will never have the ability to access receive all 10 messages from how to change your life in 10 days on cd for your ministry gift of just 50 dollars, or on dvd for just 75 dollars or more call write or visit roncarpenter.com to order this powerful series these 10 messages will speak into your life with a level of impact like no other series has ever done before change your life in 10 days start today and now Back to Redemption with Ron Carpenter. If you could just see your life the way God sees it. <laughs> oh, if you could just see it the way God sees it. You just see it the way it is. If you could just see it the way God sees it. I'm only 44 years old, which I don't care what you think, it ain't old. <laughs> that ain't old. But I can already see things in my life that while I was walking through it, I said, God, how in the world? How in the world? Anybody else like that? I need to see some. Uh, how, when, when I was in the middle of it, how in the world will I ever recover from that? How, how in the world will I ever be right again? How in the world? Did, this don't even make sense. God, are you even? I've gotten to the place. Oh, I can't say. God, are you even real? Is anybody up there? Is it is really? Is this, is, this all, is this stuff fake or is there really a God? Come on, I'll be real with you. I'll be real. I've had times where it hurt so bad and the tears were coming out so much and I had so much trouble on the right and the left. I'd say, God, how in the world can you only to look back just a few years later and see where the steps of a good man were ordered by the Lord 
and God used my trouble to bless me and God used my enemies to bless me and God used people who hated me to bless oh come on and God used pain to help me and even God used my falling to help me get back up again somebody shout hallelujah yeah yeah I know I am. You just wait. I ain't even got started. If y'all want to hear some good preaching, don't be missing no none of Sundays no time soon. I got to preach in me. Good gracious, I got to preach in me. Woo, hallelujah. Somebody say, bless him, Lord. <laughs> now, let me take some time and just work this thing a little bit right here. I got so much information that I'm trying to think how in the world I'm going to get it to you. Put Hebrews 13, 15 on the screen. Hebrews 13, 15 on the screen as quickly as you can, please. <clears throat> Therefore, by him, talking about Jesus, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. <clears throat> now, here's the problem. They lived... In Bethlehem, for short, Judah. Bethlehem means bread or word. Judah means praise. They left the word and they left the praise and everybody starts dying. Let's talk. <laughs> Malon, the son, dies. Shilion, the son, dies. Elimelech, the father, dies. Because when you leave the word and you leave the praise, everything starts dying. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit. Because we are now entering an entertainment generation where nobody wants to participate anymore. And you got to understand that God created two vital components for your spiritual life, and it is the Word, and it is your praise and worship life. And right here, all the way back thousands of years ago, these archaic characters, God is making a statement right off the bat. If you're not continually in a place where there is the bread being broken, the Word of God, and there's not a continual place of praise, then you can't sustain the things that are alive in your life. Everything around you will begin to die. And you ain't caught on to this yet, but I'm coming your way. You just hold on. <laughs> See, the fact is, God designed praise to be the environment in which God dwells and everything has its own environment that it has to live by I have shown you so many times in Genesis 1 how God delicately created and then placed something in the environment that would sustain it God could not create a fish without water. He put fish in water because it took water to sustain the life of the fish. He put the star in the sky because the sky contains the natural gases that are needed to sustain the star and keep it burning. He put the plant in the ground because all the nutrients are in the ground to sustain the plant. When you remove any of these from their environment, death steps in. I'm preaching real good. Well, did you know that you have an environment because you came out of God? And when you separate yourself from God, immediately your money starts dying. Come on. Your soul starts dying. Your emotion starts dying. Your peace starts dying. Your joy starts dying. Then your marriage will start dying. Then your kids will start going crazy. Come on. Then your business will start taking a nosedive. Why? Because God blesses you to a place. Am I preaching too hard? God blesses you to a place where you think you no longer need him you think you had something to do with getting there and so immediately it's amazing how many people will not miss church they won't miss word they won't miss praise and worship they down at the front dancing before God and God begins to pull them out and God begins to elevate them and they begin to meet a nice guy they begin to get a new job they get their kids some help and then all of a sudden God puts them back in a good place why? because of the word and because of praise and then they say well you know what I really don't need it no more I'm blessed 
enough, I can take a few Sundays off. Hey, I'm blessed enough, and Wednesday night has become an inconvenience for me. And you know what? I can slide a little bit on my morning devotion and my nighttime devotion. And then we begin to get away from the environment God planted us so we could survive. I'm teaching it. I don't know if they want to hear it, Ken. You want to help me. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> so, we go out church hunting. <laughs> and we choose churches for this reason. That's where my family goes. Yeah, I'm coming at you. I'm coming at you hard. <laughs> we go out church hunting. Well, I really don't get much out of it, but my kids have so much fun. <laughs> well, you know, it don't really feed me anymore, but I grew up there. So I pay my tithe and all there, and then I run over to Redemption at the 1230 service after my service is over with. <laughs> We have a generation of preachers that are so weak at wanting to preach the word, but know how to give you a show. <laughs> and they're so scared they're going to offend somebody. I'll be highly disappointed in myself if you get out of here any Sunday and I hadn't offended you two or three times. Because I've got to offend you to change you. The word is not always going to agree with your lifestyle. The word's not always going to agree with your attitude. The word's not always going to agree with your conduct. And I'm not going to settle in with your conduct. I'm going to settle with the word. And I'm going to speak the word right into your bad behavior. Right into your bad attitude. Right into your rebellion. And let the word begin to do the work. Come on. Because if I ever leave the bread, if I ever leave Bethlehem, if I ever leave my praise, I can't afford to because everything around me will start dying and somebody that refuses to let your life die just give God a 10 second hallelujah glory shout without the music hallelujah Tell four or five people say, you can't let it die. You can't let it die. You can't let it die. <laughs> oh, glory, glory, glory. I feel something stirring. <laughs> 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 Hallelujah. Boaz is in Judah. Jesus is in the praise. Jesus is in the word. Why would you think you're going to find anything outside of the praise and the word? You need Jesus for the problems you got. You can't handle them yourself. And Jesus ain't in Moab. Jesus is over here in Judah. What you don't understand is we're not singing songs. I'm talking to people who don't understand why we clap and dance and shout and why it's so loud. I'm, I'm talking to people who you may be here, but you don't really know what you're doing. You got to understand Jesus said, praise me. When you clap your hands, clap them, all you people, and shout to God with a voice of triumph. He didn't tell me to come in and be scared I'm going to make a sound and a deacon take me out if I say amen. He didn't tell me to come in and make sure I look better than anybody. Now, this is not a fashion show. What's wrong with you? He didn't tell me to see what your new makeup looks like. I don't give a flip about your hat. I don't care nothing about your shoes. I don't care if you're coming here stinking or smelling good. I came in to give God glory. And I'm entering his gates with thanksgiving. And I'm entering his courts with praise. Know ye that he is the Lord. And bless his name, for the Lord is good. His mercy endureth to all generations. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? And I will act a fool at age 44. I will dance even if I don't have rhythm. I'm going to clap even if it hurts your ears. I'm going to move even if you try to box me in. I got to pray. My God, I can't be silent. I got 
to get to Jesus and Jesus is in Judah. I can't sit here on my behind. I need to get where God is and God is in my praise. He's in Judah. He's in Judah. He's in Judah. Where's Jesus? When you open your mouth, he's right there in the midst of you. He is in your praise. This ain't no popularity contest. This ain't go to church and see who'll make the less demand on me. This ain't go find the place where I'm comfortable. This is where I come to corporately give God a praise. Why? Because I've come up on some devils this week that I need Jesus. And Jesus lives in Judah. And if I'm going to get Jesus, i got to do some Judah. i got to give God some glory. You can't. You know what, here we are again. I just want to be another one of the people to say Happy New Year's. And I do truly wish that. I want it to be happy. Happy are those whose God is the Lord. Every place where you put God first will bring happy happenings. Happy is the root of happenings. Happy comes from happy happenings in your life. And I believe that God wants things to happen to you that are good, things that are better than they have been. You know what? We have two wonderful services during the holidays. We had our red carpet Christmas. And for those of you who have never watched it, never seen it, uh, of course, we have our New Year's Eve blowout. We don't have many traditions around redemption. We don't even use the word a lot. But this, this New Year's Eve service has almost taken on a life of its own. I'd say it's half New Year's Eve party and half church. And when you put the two together, it just ends up in a bunch of Jesus crazy people having an explosion of praise and worship and just getting together and having fellowship and bringing the new year in God's way. Here's what I want to do. I want to thank those of you who so faithfully last year and maybe over the years have been partners with us who may not give on a monthly basis, but every once in a while, God's just laid it on your heart to give. And those that have purchased different services and different products and books from us, I want to say thank you for helping support everything that we do. But I want to offer something new to maybe those at the first of the new year saying, I am searching for God at what ministry he would have me to sow into. I want to offer you a package of these two services. This red carpet Christmas that we did, which was a powerful presentation. Not only that, but our New Year's Eve service, which was I was speaking on Lazarus, which shows you sometime God will let it get worse just so he can show you a side of him you've never seen before. These two messages come together, and for whatever your first month's gift is, whatever size, whatever amount, I'm going to take these two passages and put them in your hands as a gift, saying thank you for partnering with us. We would love for many of you to come on board. Great things are happening here, and God's opening many opportunities, but we can't do it alone. But when you and I partner together, we are much more powerful together than we are apart. Thank you for all you do. God's going to do something wonderful in your life this year, and I can't wait to see you till next time. God bless you.